morning. My name is Shane McDonald. This presentation is on globalization and social theory. Today we're going to be covering the globalization as a concept. Wallerstein, Mills, Harvey, and my choices of Merton and Bannon. And then we're going to discuss the theory that's best for understanding globalization as a whole. So globalization as a concept. The concept of globalization is not necessarily a new phenomenon. It's become front and center and clearly evident in the World Wide Web generation. As technology and transportation have opened up the world to most people and their seamless transnational information exchange, economic exchange of goods in a capitalist free market, and cross-border cultural shifts that are constantly happening. It's led to an increased interaction, integration, interdependence of nations around the world uh, as they become intertwined politically, culturally, and economically. Economically, in uh, global supply chains and free trade agreements, that open resource access to previously geographically isolated areas. Politically, in the international institutions such as the UN, uh, United Nations, International Monetary Fund, and World Bank. Uh, culturally, in social media and cross-border travel, uh, people are constantly moving around the world, uh, which is highlighting societal factors causing cultures to uh, converge. Uh, first theorist is uh, Wallerstein. Uh, Wallerstein was heavily influenced by Marx and Engels developing the world systems, his world systems theory to include class struggle, capitalist development of technology and control of labor, defining how it affects culture around the globe. His focus was on capitalism and how it acts as an economic mode greater than what any one political entity can control, thus creating the world economy. These political entities take on the uh, most economic loss while the private sector receives all the gains uh, among the capitalists. Due to technology, the boundaries of the world economy are constantly changing, creating economic tasks that are not evenly distributed throughout the world system under a form of uh, social organization. This uneven organization refers to core states, uh, which are the advanced power hubs of capitalism, the periphery, which are the weakest and are typically exploited by the core and capitalists, and you got the semi periphery, which kind of acts like a bridge in between the middle and um, between uh, a buffer between the two. And core states, a strong machinery mixed with national culture explains how these disparities have become justified and what Wallerstein calls integration. Capitalist world economy only cares about accumulated capital rather than labor power, leading to an expanding economic and social gap in different parts of the world. And Wallerstein identifies world systems as the only real social system, which must, must account for the emergence, consolidation, and political roles of classes and st status groups. He elaborates that classes only exist under conflict situations, but the capitalist class is the universal class in the modern world system. They organize politics against those who seek the traditional rank but more importantly, against the workers of the world. So with uh, Wallerstein applying it to uh, globalization, I mean, Wallerstein pretty much is globalization, the explanation of it uh, and this class system and how it's developed over time. Uh, so everything prior to globalization kind of held this nation state view of class. Uh, even the Marxists saw capitalism as international, but there was a nation state that was gonna act as a mediator between different classes and groups around the world. But this is no longer the case with globalization. Uh, Robinson and Harris introduced the transnational capitalist class and decided that this is the global ruling class. Their focus on accumulation and production, uh, which we can apply to uh, Wallerstein's global social system. Globalization has transitioned the national bourgeoisie uh, into the transnational or global bourgeoisie, uh, therefore creating a global proletariat. Economic, social, and uh, political, cultural processes, including class formation, uh, they're now global, shifting the process of social production and reorganizing class structure of the world uh, with a transnational class formation, a key aspect of the globalization process, according to uh, Robinson and Harris. Similar to the core periphery model, there's a transnational elite, uh, the world's poor majority, and then a small shrinking layer of middle classes uh, that really exercise little power in the world, you know, mostly pacified with mass consumption. Those in the poor majority that are not pulled into the transnational global elite process are constantly contained and repressed. Next, we have Mills, who uh, identified the power elite 
of the United States uh, developed who the true rulers are, according to him. So power elites made up of the executives of all the large corporations and companies of the country, uh, leadership of the executive branch of the federal government, and leaders of the military industrial complex. Uh, they all make decisions with enormous consequences, commanding the major hierarchies and organizations of modern society. Unlike Marx, he did not see the mode of production as the cause of inequality. Instead, like Weber, it was multiple areas uh, separate from the economic class uh, using power as a variable that the elite are able to control. So the economic, political, and military domain, domains where power resides uh, with such institutions as the family, church, and school serving as subordinate to these uh, powerful uh, domains. He also described the conversion of the middle class and the subservient droning employees of large corporations and government agencies, echoing Weber's account of bureaucracy and formal rationality. Wealth power, wealth, power, and prestige are interchangeable, and the more you have of one, the more you're easily able to accumulate of the other. Uh, if you have wealth, you can easily gain power, and if you have prestige, you can easily control the chance of achieving any kind of wealth. Uh, he uh, further elaborates in current society and how the population is simply becoming just receivers of opinions from the media. Uh, rather than having their own uh, original political thought or public debate. And that was like 40 years ago, so it's getting even worse now. Uh, with Mills and globalization, he identified the power lead in the United States, but we can interpret it the same concept to the world and the globalization. Again, Robinson and Harris mentioned a historic block uh, that's made up of transnational corporations, economic planning elites, dominant political party and state elites, and media conglomerates. They mentioned the World Economic Forum as an exam exemplary example of the transnational power elite, and that's going to include the CEOs of the top 1,000 transnational corporations who are the core of the WEF, uh, representatives from 100 of the most influential, influential media groups worldwide, key policy, key policy makers excuse me, from national governments, and some academic experts. Uh, this is all very uh, reminiscent of Mill's description, with the exception of the military arm. Uh, but we are able to apply this to globalization as well and by seeing how much control uh, that NATO has over the, in the world. Uh, they can make almost any military move that they mo want globally and use it under the guise of peacekeeping. Uh, not to mention the military industrial complexes, weapon research, development, and sell the nations around the world. Also in relation to Mill's wealth, power, and prestige, uh, Robinson and Harris believe social power domination is exemplified by wealth implemented through control of these world institutions. Resolving any difficulties with their accumulation of wealth, uh, the dominant groups of power sought to transnationalize. Uh, transnationalize. Uh, media is also transnationalized, and they have uh, tightened their control of information, leading to a cultural domination and a central role in producing the ideological and cultural basis for which the power elite uh, is intermixed with other classes. Uh, Harvey pretty much just gives us a history lesson and explanation of neoliberal neoliberalism, how it developed, uh, making different policy decisions, but they pretty much were to protect the uh, wealth of the top 1%. Uh, with the Bretton Woods Conference of Keynesian Economics after World War II, and better liberalism came to be, uh, was used to avoid another Great Depression. Stagflation and other factors in the 70s, uh, asset values dropped. And, uh, the upper classes had to move decisively if they were to protect themselves from political and economic annihilation. So they went with the liberalization of trade and financial instruments, deregulation of state economic decision making, and private, privatization of public entities uh, that may get in the way of capital accumulation uh, for private entities. It's led to the abandonment of the gold standard, along with the uh, onset of neoliberalism. neoliberalism Harvey notes that neoliberalism is not restored capital accumulation on a global level, it's instead restored as or created the power of an economic elite. According to him, the political project of neoliberalism this whole time was just created to reestablish the condition for capital accumulation and restore the power of the economic elite. I'm referencing Dumbernail and Levy, Harvey concludes that neoliberalism was in fact a project to restore class power all along. So applying this to globalization, Neoliberalism was national centric, then globalization is the same process except on a world scale. So the liberation of capital from geographically isolated nation states and profits are dispersed throughout the world based on a neoliberalist global financial system. It's kind of different than the simple international financial flow of previous periods of time, uh, but under neoliberalism, third world countries and others are brought into this fold by 
liberalizing their stock markets and creating a sort of dependency on foreign investment. Uh, local capitalists turn into national capitalists and their consolidation, bringing in a new era of corporate capitalism. The neoliberalists were able to facilitate the advancement of globalization by using nation state institutions and restructuring global economics to meet the needs of these transnational corporate elites. Harvey mentions neoliberalism as the basis for the restoration of the economic elite, uh, but it's through this market liberalization for capitalism on a global scale was able to accomplish this even further. These transnational groups of local elites rose to the highest levels of policy making and were ensured linkage to the global economy and creating a global infrastructure to things like NAFTA, APEC, Euro European Union, uh, World Trade Organization. These and other global institutions like the IMF and the World Bank uh, they have created a global capitalist hegemonic block for the economic elite. Um, next, we have Merton. And Merton saw society as a structure without a subject, uh, social structure, culture, social processes. Uh, they all happen without the action of the individual. Uh, with this, crime is a byproduct of a structure, and deviance occurs when actions fall outside the cultural and social structure themselves. Merton's an anami refers to the gap between the good life and the structurally available means to legitimately get to the good life or attain that status. Merton believed that there were two important elements of social and cultural structure, including culturally defined goals, along with acceptable means to attain these goals. Uh, the more capitalist a society is, the more deviant behavior will emerge, uh, kind of like in the United States. So if the good life is associated with wealth, again, like the US, the very limited positions at the top and the competitive struggle to get there, it's going to likely yield fraud, corruption, and organized crime. Uh, Merton believed that this is the individual's response to social conditions uh, of the structure and anatomy, and inequality uh, leads to this crime and deviance, but doesn't necessarily uh, come from poverty. So Merton and globalization, if globalization is the current social structure, then the individual's response to globalization, uh, inequality of wealth by a select few capitalists at the top uh, can lead to crime and deviance as well. Transnational organized crime has benefited in the same way that multinational companies have with globalization. Uh, there's a high demand for drugs in Europe and North America, weapons in Africa and the Middle East, and exotic animals in Asia, exploitable humans everywhere. Uh, they're going to take the advantage of a sheer amount of shipping containers moving across the world at any time and how quickly these shipping containers must be processed to meet deadlines so a lot of stuff slips through the cracks not only that but the same technology and transport achievements that led to globalization also makes it way easier for these organized crime groups to link together resources and expertise uh, internet's now an arena for fraud and extortion identity theft corporate data everything stolen and then you got the dark web which allows easy access for nefarious products and services. That's the same way globalization allows someone to order a product on Amazon from across the world uh, on the dark web and order some pretty bad things. Uh, finally, we got uh, Francis Fannin, uh, which present, he presents a black and white world where uh, all the white are good and all the others aren't. Uh, they're vile, animalistic, savage, primitive. Uh, it leads to a colonial practice of exploitation among others in a racially dom dominated social structure. He states that in capitalist societies, uh, many factors are ingrained in the social order that makes policing uh, the ex exploited person much easier uh, than in colonial countries where you need more direct action and pure force. Since the colonial era, the world has been defined by who belongs to a certain race, uh, not realizing the economic reality, inequality, and immense differences in ways of life uh, among the human realities. And has also been interpreted as believing that the subaltern can only forge a new identity with struggle as a condition of dominance and inequality that has been constructed through violence can only be deconstructed through violence. The uh, reason I chose Fannin uh, to apply to globalization, because uh, he focused on this historical colonization in regards to the exploited black and white world, but can we see globalization as a new form of colonialization? Uh, with the exception of Japan, most of the core states are all European or American white, and most of the, all the peripheries uh, consist of non-whites. Uh, Mendes France states that the former colonizers have been replaced by the new bourgeoisies, uh, the current capitalist classes of globalization. It includes that there's a, a civil military presence in uh, many periphery countries, uh, leading to a current state of subordination as foreign supervision simply watches over. Uh, humanitarian intervention, the style of NGOs, non government organizations, create a structural dependency in the form of charity. Uh, militaries protect interests of multinational corporations around the world. 
as it propelled less developed countries into the, interna into the international market. Uh, Minus France summarizes the best by saying, the economic crisis is a crisis of Western capitalism. For the people of Africa and the Arab world, recolonization and their auspices of military humanitarian intervention no longer invokes the mission to civilize, but the responsibility to protect a slippery invention of the self-proclaimed international community. It keeps its oppressive nature, but with an alienating, dispersonalized character. Uh, so the, what's the most useful theory in understanding globalization? So all the theories are pretty uh, spot on and helpful with globalization. I got Waller Steen, who defines the class structure and inequality around the world. And the core periphery model that he developed is used in almost every academic discussion in every subject. And then you got Mills Power Elite, uh, which is going to describe who the world decision makers are. <clears throat> uh, then you have Hardy, who explains what neoliberalism is, how it came to be, and how it's turned into globalization, a new form, uh, gave rise to a global economic elite. Uh, and then with Merton, you got the means, uh, without the means to reach the status of an economic elite and wealthy like most people, uh, we can apply his theory to give reasoning why there's transnational crime. And then finally, we got Fannin and his inclusion of a colonial and uh, racism and then using this to investigate if globalization is doing the same thing with a new colonization as uh, nation states and transnational companies invade and pillage poor ethnic periphery countries. However, in my opinion, I believe we should focus on Mill's power elite theory the most, uh, just because of what's going on in the redistribution of power in the world. Uh, and uh, we got this thing uh, that has been uh, quite the buzzword, which is the Great Reset. So uh, if, we, if they implement that, it's going to have profound implications on the global society and class structure. Uh, if we throw out all the conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff, just looking at the facts of it, that's a plan from the World Economic Forum we just mentioned was the quintessential transnational global elite class uh, that Robin and Harris had told us about 20 years ago. Uh, so it was first drafted during the 2008 economic crisis. They rehashed it after the COVID pandemic. So they're trying to really push this agenda after every global catastrophe. Uh, it's described as a multi-stakeholder partnership and specifically uh, they include the term stakeholder capitalism or the idea that global capitalism should be transformed so that corporations no longer focus solely on serving shareholders, but become custodians of society by creating value for customers, suppliers, employees, communities, and other stakeholders. Uh, so they're treating this as and heralding this as the largest redesign of global government since World War II, with corporations being included as official stakeholders in global decision making. Uh, rather than just the governments who are now going to get relegated to just one of many people have a say and us in the civil society are left with no say at all. So this is considering more co consolidating more power to the corporate arm and the power to lead and reinforce, reinforcing class disparity in global capitalism. Uh, so the transnational bourgeoisie uh, will be the decision makers for the entire world and it will be based on profit and capital accumulation instead of the needs of the world and other classes. So something to think about. So in summary, uh, we discussed globalization as a concept. Uh, and then Wallerstein uh, covered Mills, Harvey, Merton, and Fannin, and then developed, uh, to explain how all these theories are uh, summarized and uh, importance to globalization, and then discussed uh, uh, Mills' power elite and applying that to uh, the Great Reset and uh, the World Economic Forum's drive to reestablish or reorganize power. These are references and thank you for listening.